Uh, thanks for inviting me to speak. Uh, so like I said, I'm going to speak for about 10 minutes, 10 to 15 minutes on, um, first of all, my experiences within Labour uh, from 2016 to 19 to try and elicit some points for discussion uh, about can a mass socialist party be built. Um, so like I say, I was in Labour from 2016 to 19 to December 19 and um, we've seen the membership of Labour rise massively, you know, uh, in about 2015, I think they had a membership of about 150, 280,000, depending on whose figures you believed. And then, you know, during the course of 2016, 17 uh, and 18, it went up to, you know, 650,000. So illustrated a massive increase there. And, you know, was, I, I would argue, was the zenith of, uh, in terms of membership, uh, the biggest social democratic party across Europe um, and seeing people, you know, enter the Labour Party um, for a specific purpose, obviously, was the, to get Jeremy Corbyn elected leader of the Labour Party and then to change direction of Labour away from the previous years, the Blair, the Brown years and the Miliband years of drift um, towards uh, a neoliberal party that was centred on accepting much of if not all, the Thatcher agenda in the 80s. So what did this mean at um, a, a local level, a CLP level? And I think that it's useful because it illustrates some of the difficulties that people had when they entered Labour with, with so much enthusiasm, which, which they did, I would argue, they, they really did. So at a local level, what it meant um, for people, and they might find it interesting, is that, you know, meetings obviously increased... Uh, the membership of meetings increased, you know, from my own constituency from 20 to 25 up to about 80 to 100 members. So straight away, there was a massive increase in, in membership at CLP's meetings. But more importantly was, in, for me, was that people were contributing um, much more at CLP meetings, I, I see. Um, and after the initial increase at my local CLP, what, what we people started to do was, was, was organise outside of the CLP, recognising that um, the CLP wasn't delivering the level of discussion they wanted, the level of democracy they wanted. So people started to organise independently outside of that, which was, I thought, many valuable lessons were learned from that as people um, learn how to organise again, um, develop networks with people uh, on similar sort of topics, um, so that was particularly useful. Um, there was a number of dis disagreements and difficulties with that as well, because I think what came out of that was that people had different ideas of where Labour wanted to go, if I'm honest. You had people that were extremely loyal to, to Jeremy and, and some people that were much more critical that sort of said this is just the start of something um, much bigger, which was uh, interesting in itself. Um, so out of this um, disagreements, um, came the the sense that you know do you have to take positions within the Labour Party is that going to change it uh, and many people did stand for position at CLP level and the council level um, and took many positions on the CLP and I would say that was replicated right across the country um, which seen CLP's greater you know uh, a greater involvement from membership discussion discussion of really you know topical issues whether you know be sort of PFIs, you know, how do we redistribute wealth in society, um, right across the board, yeah. Um, so that was, it was really exciting at one point, if I'm honest, you know, it was, you know, there was a, an enthusiasm, there was a, a sense that things were changing, that the party was beginning to sort of become members, uh, a members party again, rather than, you know, people sort of organising in smoky rooms and, and making decisions behind, behind closed doors. Um, that was the good part. <laughs> there was a, a good part, and uh, that, that was it. The, 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 what did, that didn't translate into, though, was um, taking positions, I would say, at a council level. Um, so at a council level, it was much more difficult for, I would say, newer members with much more left-wing uh, views to actually get into the, to the council. Um, and I think that was a, a problem because the selection process was made up of existing councillors, um, which made it extremely difficult for, for left candidates to try and even get on the selection list. Um, so that, that was a difficulty there. Um, and I'd probably also argue that the gains um, 
of the left um, coalesced around Corbyn in the CLP, never never translated into gains uh, at council level. You got the odd few here, there, and everywhere, but did that you know did that make much difference? No, it didn't. Um, and I think what came out of that is was a big disagreement about how councils could fight because there was there was a number I would say, and I would say this this was sort of reflective across the country again. A number of people were quite um, pessimistic about Labour councils fighting cuts. You know, um, people would point to the militant years and the tactics used in the 1980s, how would that have fell apart? And councillors, existing councillors, would then back that up with, yes, you know, we don't want our own sequestrated by the courts and whatever. So there was some interesting discussion about that, um, which came out of those years. Um, obviously, there was... Um, uh, a strand of us that argued that you know councils could be part of a, a national fight back it didn't have to go down the the road of what happened in the 1980s with the benite left and militant tendency they were in a different side, type of period you know than than that and you know and they that, that was interesting there was some members that were pulled to you know this preston model you know about this use of local procurement to potentially regenerate um local economies um some people went down that avenue and then some people like myself and others were much more critical of that sort of saying it had severe limitations. So there was a discussion going on on the left and it was vibrant and, you know, uh, there were many more people involved than had ever been involved before in the local Labour Party. Um, but that didn't translate to any, you know, um, change of policy at a council level, I would argue. Um, whereas on that CLP level, there was changes in the sense of we could bring workers' struggles to the CLP get support from the CLP, whether a message of support or even financial. So that that was something that was solid, but it never got through to uh, um, a council level. And I, I've got a big uh, box here that just says a sense of entitlement. And, and I think that's what a lot of the left members came up to at, against every single time in, in, in the Labour Party. That was either from Labour MPs, from regional Labour officials, or even from local Labour councillors, all the way down to the bottom, this sense of entitlement that somehow they, you know, were, you know, we didn't, people, the left didn't really know the the, the intricacies of, of their clever arguments. And, you know, you need to just, uh, you know, just listen to us and and, and eventually you'll, you'll see sense, you know, that rather condescending sort of attitude that um, they use a lot of the time. And, and that was quite prevalent um, throughout every discussion that you would have, if I'm honest. Um, you had to bite your tongue a number of times. Uh, I don't know how many songs I, uh, I had left by the, the end of some CLP meetings, but, you know, they were, they were interested in that sense. So that came... Uh, I always remember a particular incident as well in, in June 2016. I remember the old chicken coup when um, 171 Labour MPs tried to uh, get Corbyn to stand down over the Brexit vote, you know, blaming him for that. And it was it illustra illustrated to me perfectly the limitations that we were we had in Labour. It was the re first real example, I think, of, of the PLP uh, wouldn't allow the Labour Party to be pulled leftwards. Um, what did that mean at a local level? Well, it was quite interesting at a local level because what did members do? Well, members organised petitions outside the local CLPs and whatever when they were, people were walking in saying that Corbyn needs to be supported. This is absolutely undemocratic. How could you do this? This is appalling. Do you know what I mean? He was elected by the membership. Um, and that came to a quite an interesting um, situation in our CLP where I stood outside with others uh, with a petition and 50, oh, for 54 members, 34 signed, the petition supporting Corbyn um, at the mayoral uh, election meeting that we had. Um, and when our own MP uh, walked in, you know what I mean? I asked her, would she sign it? And obviously not. And then she sort of says, well, if you don't like me, you can get rid of me. And it says, well, we can't because we don't have mandatory deselection. So this, you know, I mean, it, it, it was it was quite amusing at times because when you've got, you know, people talking about democracy and then you try to get an element of that democracy within an organization and you can it you don't know literally where to go um and then from there we looked at the um one really progressive thing was the democracy review in labor at the time where um chris williamson uh, and one or two others were going around the country trying to get you know a more democratic um elements within the party structures or whatever and and then again you've seen Labour MPs, ironically, you know, 
briefing to the press screaming that Labour members were trying to deselect them, if only but, if only but, um, which again illustrated the this sense of entitlement that, you know, we are destined to, 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 to rule and you just there be the foot soldiers. Uh, and that was quite prevalent, I thought, from from that sort of attitude. Um, I've got an interesting little quote here, again, uh, from Ken Loach, and I thought it was quite apt when it says, a broad church doesn't work when the choir is trying to stab the vicar in the back. And I thought that was exactly what was happening a number of times. Um, I think Ken's hit the, the nail on the head there. It, it happened various times, like I said, the, the chicken coup and our own examples um, in, in Middleton and Awood. And I think that, what that all illustrated was that there was a lack of innate democracy within the organization and when members pushed that the response that they got a number of times was um you don't know the organization you don't know this you don't know that and when it was quite funny when members found out about the things that they're not supposed to know um obviously underhand tactics were used on a, on a number of occasions some of the real positives of those years though was the that every time worker struggles were brought up at CLP level, every time support for organisations, um, progressive, you know, whether it be the Palestinian issue or whatever, overriding support came from the majority of the CLP. Um, even those people that, who I would say were on the right or in the centre, whether that was from self-preservation or whatever, I'm not quite sure. But again, you know, um, it illustrated uh, there was a thirst for ideas, a thirst for how do we re redistribute wealth in society. And um, those CLP meetings were, you know, were dynamic at times. Um, a shame that it didn't peter through to other elements of the party. Um, so I would argue that those years were frustrating years. Those years were, were um, years where fundamentally it didn't change the nature of the party. But what it did do was develop um, networks of people that are still here involved in, in, in worker struggles that are um, renewed with a renewed sense of um, hope in, in different worker struggles, whether it be strikes in the buses or wherever, that are involved in those struggles now, that have learned how to organise um, through their experiences within Labour. And I'm not saying all, all people that have come out of, of Labour I've, I've done that, but I would say there's a substantial uh, number that I have, and that gives me hope that those people and other people and various struggles can be part of a movement going forward, and they've learned a valuable lesson, if rather an harsh lesson sometimes, um, through the experience of trying to get a left-wing uh, alternative elected. Thanks, Derek. I think it's quite right that we start with the discussion of what, ha what happened during Corbynism, um, given that that was the thing that gave so many people hope that it was possible to have a mass socialist party and to look back on that and see, see what that uh, produced. Uh, I I'm going to take a slightly different approach, though. I'm going to try, and, first of all, to address three, uh, three concepts, I suppose, that are raised in either the title or the description of today's uh, meeting and then talk about how the current lack of a mass socialist party might change. Um, so the three th three concepts I want to talk about is you know it, it uses the word socialist, it uses the phrase working class, it uses the word party, and I think these are all phrases that people understand to mean very very different things. So I think it's worth just exploring those a little bit um, if we're thinking about how a, a mass socialist party might uh, might come into being. So starting with uh, the, the term socialist, I mean, I, I think it's got as many meanings as the word Christian. Um, you know, so many people call themselves or each other um, socialists. And I, I guess I want to be clear what I mean when I'm talking about socialists. So I think there have been various ways society has organised itself over the years. We had uh, societies that didn't have classes at all uh, in early human history, we had slavery, feudalism, we've now got capitalism. And my view is that there's no particular reason why a system that's been uh, dominant for uh, you know, a few hundred years uh, should continue forever. Uh, and uh, you know, socialists uh, aim at replacing capitalism, not just tinkering with it, making it a bit less harmful 
uh, to us because we recognize that capitalism inherent in capitalism as a system is that kind of competitive drive to maximize profits no matter what the cost is in terms of the impact on people on war uh, and on the on the planet i think the second important point to make about socialism is uh, kind of what it's not um, so at the moment we have a society that claims to be democratic and yet most of the people who take the decisions that affect our lives whether you talk about your boss at work or your landlord or people in the city or generals or judges these people are not elected they're not accountable they're there by dint of uh, their class uh, position their wealth um, and their power and i think socialism has to mean a thoroughgoing democracy not that kind of current fake democracy and certainly not the kind of top-down dictatorships that have often claimed to be um, uh, claimed to be socialist um, uh, in various countries. And I think we have to recognise that the rich and powerful won't give up their wealth and power without a fight. And therefore, the idea of you know, socialism has to involve a collective struggle, not just elections, and a revolution to replace capitalism with uh, a different sort of society. So I think that's the first thing that I, I, I want to be clear what, what it is that certainly when I talk about my socialist party, I'm not just talking about something that's trying to make capitalism a bit less harmful. Um, the second uh, concept used in the description was about the working class. And again, this is a phrase used to mean many different things. Often in the media, you'll hear the marketing uh, uh, um, categories, you know, A, B, C, D, 1, E and so on, uh, that were invented a long time ago for a particular purpose that was nothing to do with trying to change society. It was everything to do with trying to to sell us cars and washing machines. Um, you hear the phrase used as a kind of cultural label, an identity um, almost. And I guess when I'm talking about working class, I'm thinking about how society is structured in relationship to the, you know, our, our, us producing the, you know, all the things we need to live, uh, the way that most of us have to sell our labor power in order to uh, make ends meet. But I'm not just talking about those currently in paid work. The working class includes other people uh, uh, you know, associated with them, whether that's people who are young or old or people who are temporarily unemployed, people who are sick, people who are carers and not in paid uh, employment. So uh, I just wanted to be clear when, when, when I'm talking about the working class, that, that's what I mean, that kind of broad conception of it. So the final one of these concepts I think is worth just digging into a little bit is about party because I don't know how many of you looked at the comments on the Facebook event for today, but it was amazing how uh, widely held the assumption is that if you talk about party, you can only be talking about elections. Um, and that you know we could have a huge discussion about the different functions that um, parties can have. Um, that's probably uh, beyond the scope of today. But I think broadly you could think about it as people collectively organised in pursuit of a political objective. And my view is that inside every campaign, struggle, strike, uh, there are always arguments. There are always people putting forward different points of view, uh, let alone in the middle of a revolution. And therefore that a party uh, operating as a, a collective of socialists trying to fight for a socialist outcome to those struggles and to promote uh, socialist ideas and organisation uh, and, and action um, it, it is kind of, if we're talking about a mass socialist party, that's the sort of party I'm interested uh, in, in seeing and that I think is necessary for radical change. And that would need to be a mass party, because if you're talking about influencing all those different struggles, it would need to be rooted in every workplace and community in a country like Britain. I would argue you'd probably need it to be a uh, similar sort of size to what Labour was at its height, you know, half a million or um, uh, or more, it would have to have enough unity to be able to act and to affect what, you know, the debates and arguments and struggles that go on, but operate in a way that was supportive of initiative rather than stifling it. So not some sort of top down, um, uh, you know, robotic army, uh, but uh, a collective of thinking active, um, active people. So turning to the current lack of a mass party, which I think is causing a, a, a lot of uh, people, a lot of angst since their hopes of Corbynism were, were dashed. I, I still think it's the case that most people who ask this question think about, you know, to what extent could we revive Labour 
And I think Derek's uh, description of what happened illustrates why um, uh, that, that's not a realistic path in terms of achieving, you know, we, we had our best shot really under Corbynism. We caught the right by surprise. Some of them even nominated him because they thought he would lose. Um, uh, and even then uh, the Labour Party apparatus was left unchallenged uh, and unchanged and came back to uh, crush him. And the fact that Corbyn still denied the Labour whip even, uh, you know, I think illustrates just how, um, how far um, that, uh, that progress has been reversed. But you also hear people talking about, well, could we have some sort of regroupment of uh, the tiny shards of uh, lefty, left groups to the, to the left of Labour? Um, uh, I think is the other thing people talk about, or people might have hopes that maybe some, maybe Corbyn will set up a new party or things like that. But I think what those have in common is they're very focused on trying to marshal together enough forces to have a viable electoral project rather than focusing on other arenas of struggle. So in the blurb for today's meeting, uh, it raises the question of whether such a party is even possible, um, because we have a political terrain that I would argue is, has been for quite a long time now, dominated much more by single issue campaigns um, rather than uh, politics being driven through, um, uh, through parties. Um, and uh, we've also got a situation where, uh, you know, whereas maybe... Um, 50 to 100 years ago, most people's discussion would take place with people in their immediate neighbourhood or in their workplace. And it was possible to build up quite cohesive um, small units. And if you could get enough of those to act together or through a party, um, you could have um, you know, serious numbers and, and, and serious power. But that really isn't the pattern that we've seen, I would argue, in recent decades. We've seen electoral parties really trying to aggregate quite fragmented constituencies but, you know, by constructing manifesto those that appeal to different segments of society trying to triangulate to a, appeal to the middle ground that often means kind of watering down their um their principles um and i think those processes really do throw up the question about to what extent in in today's society rather than 50 years ago to, to to what extent is it possible um to have a kind of mass socialist party and i think it's worth coming back to um the notion that um, you know is often associated with Marx of the idea of you know I, when I described the working class I described it as a kind of objective um, uh, group of people but uh, there's the idea of a class for itself where people identify themselves as part of a um, part of a collective with shared uh, common interests and that being a, a collective that's forged in in struggle and I think one of the things that really came home to me with the defeat of Corbynism. Um, was how people were trying to kind of shortcut that process with the idea that it was possible to um, uh, you know, have electoral success and then engineer from above a revival of struggle. And I, I think the outcome of Corbynism would tend to reinforce the idea that, it, that change is likely to happen um, in, in different ways and that probably other arenas of struggle are important in terms of forging that kind of unity of the working class and the oppressed that's necessary in workplaces and communities to have a solid basis for polarising opinion in a way that can be expressed through um, a mass socialist party. Now, it's worth saying, if we're talking about this, that meetings hosted by RS21, Revolutionary Socialism in the 21st century, and RS21 is making no claim to be the party we need or even the nucleus of it. It's a tiny, um, a tiny group trying to do socialists, trying to do some useful work, developing action ideas, organisation. So it's not that I'm, I'm trying to kind of do a sales pitch that, uh, you know, aha, this is the answer, um, this particular uh, organisation. I, I would imagine there's people in the meeting from a variety of different organisations um, who, um, you know, could make simply misguided claims to have all the answers. Um, what I think is quite exciting about the current situation, though, is, or one of the things that's exciting is the way that the current cost of living crisis um, is polarising things in a way that is quite unifying for the vast majority. I mean, the Occupy movement had the phrase the 99%, which I, I thought, while not, if you like, sociologically precise, uh, did convey the idea that we're talking about the vast majority needing to rise up against um, a tiny minority. But I think uh, the small uh, protests we've seen so far 
have been quite encouraging. And I think what we can see is a process uh, that's not going to be over quickly. We're not expecting inflation to drop down um, in the next uh, couple of months. And there's the potential for that to unleash struggles on both ends of the uh, cost of living crisis, both in terms of people's incomes, whether you talk about workplace struggles over wages or you talk about uh, pensions and benefits, or whether you're talking about the, uh, uh, the, our position as consumers where uh, the government is choosing to allow prices to prices to rocket. And uh, I think that's quite a, well, it's certainly a, a, a situation that hasn't uh, been the case for a number of decades in Britain, that prices have been a political issue, because since the uh, since the start of Thatcherism, really, the government has tried to disassociate itself from uh, price setting, um, something that was very popular with governments up until the 1970s in Britain. And that has politicised the question of fuel prices in particular in a way we haven't seen, seen previously. So I, th I think that's potentially an area where we might see uh, development of more, um, uh, more unification, I suppose, of the different forces you'd need to see uh, from a socialist party, but uh, pr probably uh, not enough on its own, but I, I think quite an encouraging start. And I guess what I'd argue is that the um, if, if what, what I've said is right, that uh, to have a mass socialist party, you need to have a greater sense of a class for itself, then a focus on developing those non-electoral struggles and trying as socialists to develop radical ideas and organisation within those struggles would seem to be me a more useful approach rather than uh, trying to lash together uh, another electoral initiative. I should um, apologise. Uh, I, I think I mentioned at the beginning that um, Charlotte wasn't uh, able to, uh, um, uh, to, to, to be one of the speakers. We weren't intending to have an all-male panel, but I would you know, would encourage uh, uh, women and uh, non-binary speakers if you want to ask a question or make a contribution, uh, please, uh, you know, please do so. So I don't know, I have quite a lot to say. Um, I'm wondering if I speak, whether I should go down the kind of the road of Moses talking about Labour. Um, because partly because the personal stuff I start talking about that because I was one of the ones who was very hopeful about Labour. Uh, called into care when it first started. Got increasingly sceptical, um, had hopes revived after 2017. And after 2019, which is the thing was much worse than what it was going to be, spent quite a few months partially in denial and going around saying, we can find, we can create a new network, we can create a new party, we can do something. And just refusing to recognise that it was completely gone. You know, it was a total defeat. There were no, it was all scattered to four winds. By the, by the time the Corbyn stepped up on Cleveland, it was already too late to sign the Um But I, I, I'm, not, I'm not talking about that in detail. I want to talk about another question, which is um, how are we going to get a revolutionary party? How is it going to come about? Because um, there's been plenty of occasions, I mean, Ian talked about small groups making grant claims to be the nucleus of parties. That, there's been a lot of that over the last 50, 60 years different organizations saying, join us, we're the socialists, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and at best, they've led to groups of maybe a few thousand that have maybe done some useful work, but they've ended up being very sectarian, very sectarian, more often than not. So I don't think we should go, I don't think it's a, it's a route that leads anywhere. And I think it's straight strikes is much more likely that part, the Reverend Party will, will come about through a process that is centered really around fractures in existing working class organizations, which in this country would mean either the Labour Party or the trade union movement. Now, I don't see the Labour left ever splitting away. I think they're completely committed to being Labour, come what may. I remember saying to a friend of mine quite recently, they're Labourites first and socialists second in, in most cases. I mean, very com committed left wingers, but their loyalty is to Labour more than anything else. Is my, is my guess. Um, and I, but I'm talking about the established Labour left, not the activists who are into into, into into Labour and so forth. I'm talking about the established Labour left and the people who, who are in the, the, the different groups and who are in the PLP and the campaign, sort of campaign groups and so on. Um, there's a possibility of something 
this is the problem because Ian's talking, Ian's talking about these ideas of a new electoral party being formed and why that's not going forward, and I agree. But it seems to be more likely that a revolutionary party will come about because somebody tries to form an electoral project and there's then a period of mass struggle and that project fractures and sections of it radicalize and grow off the back of the struggle and you form a, a part and become a revolutionary party that way. That's a simplification, but that seems much more likely than a small group gradually growing over time to becoming a mass, a mass organization. I don't see that ever happening. In this country, I think we can't tell, I think, exactly how it's going to happen. It's some way off. But I don't think we can assume that it's something in the distant future that, will, that none of us will ever live to see. Because we're in an, an extremely unstable period. It's going to get more unstable. Climate change is going to get worse. I'm not going to go the whole hog and say things like it's going to be the end of civilization. Everything's going to collapse the next 30 years. Although that is a possibility. But I find it very hard to see how capitalism in its current form will still be around by, say, 2050, 2060, and certainly not by 2100, 2100. Long before the worst of climate change hits, you'll see all sorts of social instability. You're starting to see it already with, you know, everyone from Syria is partly down to climate change. Syrian civil war is partly down to climate change, apparently. And we've had the, the pandemic, which also is linked to, 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 to what's going on there. And you, I'm sure you can find, I mean, the current inflation crisis is probably has some link to that as, as, as well. And I mean, it, 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 this is all interlinked. And crises that could threaten capitalism will happen much sooner, I think, than that. Than that. And you could very well see, you know, um, revolutionary situations emerging in the next couple of decades. It's entirely possible. Not guaranteed, but entirely possible. Um, yeah. So uh, just, thanks, Roderick. Are you are you coming to a point? Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm just going to yeah. say the, the, the point is basically we probably need to start thinking about how a party is likely to be created to become the formation now, rather than seeing it as something in the distant future that we'll never have to see it. Um, okay. Um, good afternoon, comrades. Um, um, this, um, this is a rather um, incoherent uh, collection of, I of ideas I'm about to express, rather than a, um, a, a, to, the, to the point, as it were. Um, I haven't been um, a member of uh, a revolutionary uh, organisation for about 30 years, but I have continued to be a political activist and, uh, and a particularly a trade union activist. And in... Um, um, I, I, I still have a lot of friends, uh, Prince, uh, quite a lot in RS21, but principally in the SWP, but also people who have sort of moved over to the Labour Party. Um, and um, so um, I quite often am involved in discussion about, you know, where do we go from here and what are the, uh, what are the uh, possibilities for the future? And my, my ideas, I have to say, seem to have ossified in the 1970s in the sense that I'm a sort of unreconstructed Leninist. And I, I kind of see that as being, you know, a, a, a sort of a vanguardist party as being... Um, as, as being as being the way forward uh, certainly you know this is the, the lesson that history has uh, has taught us uh, uh, over the previous century but um I find it more and more difficult to see how that's going to happen given the um given the changes in 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 the nature of the way that uh, the, the the proletariat is organized um uh, uh, the changes in the way that uh, labor that uh, work is organized and the way people are organized at work um we don't have the you know the big factories the um the uh, power plants the uh, shipyards the mines etc cetera, etc cetera. and while there are there are a lot of small industrial outbreaks there are small challenges to capital i mean at the moment my own union the use to you is in is is in struggle um i question i question the degree to which the people who have been in struggle of late for example uh, in in mcdonald's the the british gas workers the, the university lecturers can in any way threaten capital in the way that 
the great um, industrial struggles of of my youth in in the, in the sixties and seventies could. Um, part of the discussion that I've had with people, or, or rather, part of the opinions that that people have expressed uh, um, uh, in, in 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 discussions that I've had with them, is is that it's the future is going to come out of the movements. Um, um, the Occupy movement, uh, Black Lives Matter, um, 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 XR, um, uh, Extension Rebellion, etc. Um, and I think the problem with that is that the pe that that those movements don't self-consciously express a class position, that people who are involved in those movements, while they may objectively be proletarians, they are not they are not participating as workers. They are participating as concerned um, uh, concerned citizens, if you like. Um, and um, I I don't really see a way. Although I take I take Roderick's you know the point he made. Um, I don't I don't really take I don't really see how I don't really see how you're going to organize those people who aren't coming from uh, a class position i don't really see how you're going to organize them into uh, a, an organization that has class politics at its at its center i think perhaps the last thing i want to say is al al although as a, as, a, as a young man um you know i imagined uh, you know i'd be on the the barricades with my uh, red flag in my hand i i think that um the real challenge to capitalism is going to come from elsewhere. It's not. It's not going to come from the European and American working class. It's. It's going to come from Vietnam and China and places like that. And and that we will be involved quite possibly on our barricades as a response to um, uh, to uh, out, outbreaks of revolutionary struggle elsewhere. I'm, I'm going to caveat what I'm going to say because I think it might be controversial, but I just wanted to throw this out for discussion really in terms of is a party structure what we really should be aiming for or does that act as a break on our various struggles? I mean, I'm caveating it with the fact that I'm not an anarchist and I see the need to organize and to collectively do things together. And I liked Ian's description of the collective thinking active group as being, as being what we'd aim for in the party. Um, and I recognize the structure of um, the tyranny of structurelessness and anarchy. So I do see the need to organize, but I feel that when we talk about that we have so much focus on party and party building, whether that's from a, a more right wing social democratic Labour Party style party and, and all the things that people have said about electoralism, but also whether it's been my experience in various revolutionary groups through the years about building the revolutionary um, party um, and or aiming to, even if you are modest enough to think that you're not actually the revolutionary party. And I wonder if that really acts as a kind of break, if you like, on both how we organize and on the struggle itself, and also on imagination about what we could do and whether we need to think about organization a bit differently and whether we can think about not just having this goal of the party, because I feel, I feel that it's held a lot of socialist organization back. I mean, Roderick put it a different way by saying we should organize the party now rather than wait until later. But I just feel that maybe we shouldn't have this as our goal. Sorry, I'm not being that coherent, but maybe putting the party first, whether I say whether it's electoralism or whether it's through a more revolutionary alternative, doesn't actually achieve the ends we want and becomes more of a bureau, either a bureaucratic break, it becomes a conservative force, and it doesn't really do the organization. And that can we think, whether we think about networks and other sort of organizational groups from the struggles that we're involved in might be a more preferable way of thinking about it. I mean, I'm, I, I'm just, I'm not saying I think this, and this is my point of view particularly, I'm just saying I've been an active socialist for decades and I feel that we need to rethink quite dramatically the 
way we organize and the way we see always going for the building the party type of model, whether it's electoral party or whether it's a revolutionary party. So I just thought I'd throw that out there. Um, I think the point that was raised about the working class and looking back to the 70s and the industrial working class, I think it's, it's and that it will come from another part of the world, the revolution, I think that's really misplaced. And it's really, de it's demeaning to what the working class looks like in, in, in the country, in, in, the, in, in uh, the UK now, because I think, you know, you've got to look at the working class as it is now, which is basically the service industries, logistics, IT, um, and that's where the workers are. And that's where we need to organize, you know, in uh, people that are on zero hours contracts. And there's a lot of, there is activity rising. There's more people taking strike action, small strikes uh, going on alongside this economic crisis that we're now finding ourselves in. And, you know, so that's the potential that's there, I think. And the other potential that there is for revolutionary socialists is to organize within the community. You know, that's what I was hoping for when Corbyn got elected organizing in the community, bottom-up organizing, but it completely didn't happen because Corbyn, why would he? He's been in parliament his entire life. He's been in the electoral system his entire life and it just never happened. And that was that's a tragedy really because momentum became an election machine to, to, get, to get Corbyn elected. Um, and I think Derek did a real brilliant summary of, because I was in the Labour Party, I joined uh, just before Corbyn got elected. And the way that he went through it, I thought that was a great summary of what happened. But now I'm finding myself, you know, getting into campaigns um, and working, for example, I've worked through, uh, I'm in Unite Community as a retired teacher. Um, I've worked in the Kill the Bill campaigning, um, the NHS campaign and now the, the cost of living campaign. And you're meeting people from the Labour Party all the time. I've actually left the Labour Party now, but I'm still working alongside them. And they're all beginning to question. I'm not saying that we're gonna go there and recruit them to our revolutionary party. I'm not saying that at all. I think what we're going to be doing is what Ian suggested, which is to be basically developing the strategies and the tactics for you know, um, building solidarity and how to campaign um, and, and how to have an alternative to, ele to electoralism. Um, you know, I was out this morning with people from the Labour Party um, campaigning around the NHS. Um, someone started off the conversation with, oh, there's a split in our Labour Party, but I've got all of my ward to agree to support the NHS campaign next Saturday. Um, so there's people organizing, you know, it is a hard place to be in. Um, with socialist politics at the moment. Um, on Thursday, we were talking about how difficult it is for Labour councillors to campaign um, around the ICSs in a meeting that I was in with some Labour Party members in Unite Community and keep our NHS public. And they said, oh, well, the Labour left councillors are not going to support us because they can't, because they're so intimidated. What we need is a revolution. You know, so you know, I'm not saying, you know, I think Ian's definition of, you know, what he said about socialism, et cetera, and the working class is absolutely right. So I think that's it. I think there's a lot of potential and it's an answer in a part of an answer to what Hazel was raising about what it means to organize as a revolutionary socialist. It, it's not building that same type of party where we're recruiting people to our party it's about working in united fronts i think that's what it's about hi everybody i'm steve lee from seattle revolutionary socialist in the u.s thanks for putting this on really interesting discussion um, so just a couple of things i think i think the all across the world um, in the last few years we've seen a rise in struggle especially right before covid but uh, continuing you know, we have revolutionary crises in different countries like Sudan and other places. And I think that all of these, all of these um, really reinforced the, the original ideas that were put forward about the need for a mass uh, revolutionary socialist vanguard party. Because a lot of times these, um, these revolutions are political in the sense that they first of all aim at getting rid of the current um, political leadership or even some of the state structure and so forth. But they're not yet social. That is, they, they're not really aimed at 
transforming the, uh, the means of production, you know, going towards socialism. And in order to get there, we need to have a, a mass revolutionary party within, uh, within the movements that are going on. Um, the original idea that Lenin put forward about the need for a mass revolutionary party has not changed. It's that there are differentiations within the working class politically, there always have been, and the most advanced, the most uh, militant, the most revolutionary need to organize together to influence the rest. And that hasn't changed. So I don't think we can in any way abandon, uh, abandon that idea. Uh, mass struggle will take place. Capitalism will force it, is forcing it, and always will force it. But uh, the outcome of that struggle is, is to, uh, determined by how well organized people are. And I also think that in the current period, a lot of the struggles that are break out are going to be more um, are more generally political struggles rather than just workplace struggles. Workplace struggles will take place, and the power of the working class at work to cut off the flow of profit is absolutely essential. But the general uh, the motivation of people getting out the streets and, and organizing will be likely be more political than directly economic. We saw that with the Black Lives Matter movement um, in 2020 in, in the U.S. We see that in many other other circumstances. Um, so the working class, even though it's divided up into smaller units, is still has the same collective relationship with capital and can still use that power at the place of work and that the class consciousness can develop, um, you know, the class for itself can develop out of the direct relationship of the class in itself, the capital. So I, I think that a lot, of the, a lot of the basic ideas are still there and people should not be shy at all about recruiting people to revolutionary organization as a long-term process of building towards um, a revolutionary social center party. So thanks a lot for having this discussion. Um, I guess for me, there's two things uh, interesting me in the role of the party. And so there's definitely the thing about organising and I liked um, Ian's description and I hear what um, Bev and Hazel are saying, but one bit of me around the role of the party, the revolutionary party, as we think about it, is to be the memory of the class. And how do we, if we're kind of more diverse, so revolutionaries, but diverse and act, acting more autonomously, how do we not get called to the kind of overriding ideology in society, which I think happened to loads of people I'll say really good people because we've got most, loads of good people who got pulled towards very reformist ideas, um, understandably. And then it's so hard to pull yourself back sometimes um, to actually thinking that even if you think revolution is the ultimate goal, then actually maybe this year what we'll focus on is elections. And that starts shaping your ideas and it starts shaping how you act in the world. So to me, that, that so how do we kind of keep ourselves accountable, I suppose is what I'm saying, as revolutionaries, would be one role of a revolutionary party. And the other role, like I said before, is the, the memory of the class. And we'll see, and to me, that's not so much around sort of, ideologies but about keeping a history alive and around what's been possible when ordinary people organize um, and to me that's one of the key things as revolutionaries we need to do today and I do think we're kind of hindered by not having a revolutionary party to do that um, and then the other thing is just the sort of stuff and I don't know how we this I think this is a challenge for revolutionaries as well is how so thinking about the Hal Draper stuff and the two um Souls of socialism and the idea that as reformists were heading to a different thing as what revolutionaries are heading to. But how as revolutionaries do we conceptualise what that revolution is? And I know there's the idea we obviously don't want to shape it or have little kind of blueprints because that's um, it's not going to be particularly useful. But how do you hold on to your kind of revolutionary verve, I suppose, without having an idea of what the future socialist society looks like and is there a role of a revolutionary organization um to kind of think about that they're just some of the questions that have been provoked for me so thank you very much for having the meeting okay um yeah thanks very much to sorry i'm charlie hall um i'm an rs21 member in london thanks very much to manchester comrades for putting this on we'll make three sort of quick and i think possibly this slightly disconnected points 
the first is about sort of single issue campaigns and there being more that we agree on than we disagree on. Well, that, that's true up to a point, but the, the, the strength of a single issue campaign is primarily that it organises around that single issue. So, you know, the health demonstrations we will have next weekend will not ask people whether or not they're in favour of the monarchy before we welcome people onto those demonstrations. Not everyone who's willing to campaign against the monarchy is necessarily a supporter of transgender liberation. Not everyone who's a supporter of trans transgender liberation necessarily agrees with the reunification of art. And, and you can go and you can go on, not you know, to a every design circle. But the reality is that different single issues, organ different campaigns organize around different aspects of um, our oppression and our exploitation under capitalism. And the point of the point of revolutionary socialist organization is to try and bring all those different strands together and to say this and to say that the common the common the common the common thread there is capitalism and talk about how we finish it um that's that's the first point but i do want to say that i think hazel has an important point in the way that people have very often talked about uh organize, organizing political parties as though that's the end as though that's the goal and the truth is, if it's going to be useful, a revolutionary socialist organization, party, call it what you will, is a means. It's a means to an end. It's a means to knit people together. It's a means, it's a means, it's a means to put our in make our individual efforts collectively more than the sum of our individual parts. But without those individual, without those individual efforts, without those, without those struggles from below, it can't be, it, you know. It's not. It's it, it. It it can't. It can't. It can't be effective. The last. The last thing, just very quickly, is say there's an old saying from the uh, Russian revolutionary Lenin that revolution. The possibility of revolution happens when two things happen. Firstly, that the rulers can't go on in the old way, and secondly, that the working class won't go on in the old way. And I think a lot of the time we tend to we tend to think that because the first is true, the second is necessarily true. And actually, they're two quite different things. The reality is that they can solve their crisis if we're prepared to let them. Um, the point of revolutionary socialist organisation is to build on the sparks of resistance that do exist and try and fan those into larger and larger flames. But we can't predict where those sparks, where those we can look at the possibilities. We can't predict where those sparks will come from or when. The, or when they'll come. Yeah, I was I was going to say that I, I used to remember the Labour Party. I was inspired by Corbyn, like uh, other people have been on the call, um, and have subsequently left the Labour Party because of the movement to the right and all the rest of it. Quite despondent about the future of politics and how we can bring about a socialist society. Um, partly because I just don't think it'll ever be allowed, um, and I know that's down to us to 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 take take it back but to do that we'd have to be large in numbers and when I was with Labour and going around canvassing and doing all the sort of events that that you have to do um I was struck by two things one was either political apathy of people who who are sometimes the most badly affected by capitalism and the second one was that the people who do believe in socialism are too busy living and getting by to get involved politically and to be an activist about it. And I think that's the crux of our problem. We've also got a gender issue here because I think that women, no offense to any man on the call, but women can really, when they come together, can really get shit done. And, and I think that we need to tap into all those that I've set up a charity during the pandemic and, and the women have just been amazing. And, and I've, I've really had an insight into um, just, just how well they can, they can be organised, how good they can be at organising. And I do think there's still a lot of women who are trapped by family and circumstance. A lot of single mums who who are at home, who who believe in things, but that can't, haven't got the time, um, which is again a symptom of capitalism. So, 
yeah, that 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 was just my two pennies really. And solidarity with the UCU completely. And I hope the students come out in support as well. They would have done in my day. I don't think they do anymore. Different times. I'm lovely sympathetic to what Juliet just said. Um, I left the Labour Party of my own accord. I, I was a member for about 20 years. I first joined um, when the Tony Blair was Prime Minister in the hope that I could help move the party toward the left. And um, in my own view, the, we had some success in the end with um, getting Jeremy Corbyn with the leader, which many of my friends at the time never thought that would ever happen in the first place. Um, my issue um, with Corbyn's leadership was the fact that um, um, that they um, the party never really took on well they didn't take on the rights of the PLP at all. They had uh, um, an opportunity to adopt open selection of parliamentary candidates, uh, which used to be party policy until near you know, scrapped it. Um, and I, I, I do think that was a massive failure of the Corbyn leadership, if you like. Um, my problem, and this is probably a bit controversial, but my, uh, my problem with uh, revolutionary parties, as it were, is that there's, um, A, there's so many of them, there were quite a few, um, and also um, that um, a lot of the electorate out there, they're not, um, they still think of politics in, um, in parliamentary terms. So there's a battle there to be um, on two fronts, if you like. Um, personally, one initiative that I'm quite interested in personally is um, this uh, uh, salute organization called PAL, P A L. Um, and uh, uh, obviously, there's about six parties involved in that. And the idea is that, um, um, I mean, they've probably been mentioned already, but the idea is that they plan at least not to stand against each other where they're going. So that, um, and I and I think that that is something that could be quite unique because uh, in uh, in party terms, because um, a lot of the time when when you have a lot of left wing parties standing elections, um, they all tend to stand against each other, and um, so I've been interested to see if this this is an 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 initiative that could actually succeed uh, in the longer term. Um, I don't really know where to go from there, but uh, yeah, I stop there. Thanks. Oh, it's been a great discussion. I mean, there's so many things. <laughs> It'd be good to uh, uh, to comment on. Um, I'll try and cover a few of them briefly. So um, I need to raised in the chat that it felt like people were kind of writing off people like her who were in the Labour Party. Um, certainly, I, I think that would be a mistake if people are. Um, I think there's uh, lots of people in the Labour Party who are involved in many important struggles and uh, many, many of those would see themselves as socialists and uh, I, I would hope would be uh, on the same side of the barricades when, uh, uh, when we get to that point. I, I think I think the issue really in terms of the discussion of this meeting is about the Labour Party as a party. I don't think it, it is a socialist party. I don't think it ever was a socialist party. I don't think it's going to become a socialist party. So though there are many socialists in it, um, I don't think it's a potential vehicle for creating the mass socialist party that uh, I think most people on the call um, think we need. Um, I agree with you as well that um, single issue campaigns are absolutely vital. Um, because they unite people for action. And it's through being involved collectively in struggle that people have their eyes opened about who's really on their side and who's not. People start to question a lot of the uh, nonsense we're fed by the media and the education system. Um, you know, uh, and people learn a huge amount by being involved in collective action. 
But I don't think those single issue campaigns, whether they're workplace or community based, are sufficient uh, for the reasons a few people touched on. Um, uh, not least that any campaign is a site of struggle itself. Within campaigns, you have people arguing for radical approaches and people arguing uh, to uh, hold things back. And we need a socialist to be organised in order to effectively try to push all of those struggles forward as successfully as possible. So I don't think they're a substitute for party organisation, but I think they are vital. Um, I, I really strongly agree with the idea that Britain is unlikely to be the leading edge of the revolution. I mean, you know, this isn't about looking at a crystal ball. It's about looking at what's happened in recent decades. You know, we've seen huge um, unrest and uprisings across uh, Middle East and North Africa, um, you know, big strike wave in China, you know, many parts of the world seeing um, uh, much more vibrant um, working class movements than we've had in Britain. And I think because of Britain's position as a declining imperial power, uh, that may well continue to be the case. What that means practically, I think, is that internationalism is vital for socialists in um, in Britain, because uh, we're going to need to give solidarity and support to struggles around the world. And I think that's another reason why trying to use the Labour Party as a vehicle for struggle is problematic, because the Labour Party aspires to run the British capitalist state and therefore has never, can't really be genuine and international if you're trying to manage one part of um, one part of capitalism. Um, in terms of whether we aim at a party or not, whether that acts as a um, as a break, um, I, I, I totally get what uh, I think Ms. Hazel was talking about about the kind of building the party model, where um, people think the organisation they've already got is the party, and it just needs to grow, and more people need to join it. I, th I think that's uh, unlikely to bear uh, bear fruit. Um, uh, so somebody said about there being so many revolutionary parties. I mean, my view is there are none, right? Uh, because a revolutionary party would be the kind of organisation that had, you know, sound politics and a mass base and, you know, be leading the class in practice in many of its struggles. And there are no organisations like that, certainly in, in Britain. I, I think it'd be great if we could create one, but uh, we, uh, you know, there's work to be done and a lot of that won't be about simply about building socialist organisation. It'll be about the movement and the working class movement as a whole getting stronger and revolutionary current um, within that. There's the old saying, isn't there, that if we all spat at once, we drown the bastards, but nobody's organising the spitting. And, and that's the challenge is that most people don't have that sense of their own power. And I think that connects with the point about apathy. Um, is that I, I don't think people, I think apathy is quite a confusing label for what I, I, I think um, I think you were describing, Juliet, that, that people are disengaged. I think a lot of that is about feeling that politics is irrelevant, that people, there's huge distrust, which has been well earned, in my opinion, in, by uh, politicians. Um, and I think trying to focus on struggles that link to people's lives as they are also helps us to overcome some of the capacity issues you talk about when struggles are part of people's lives you know where they live where they work and so on it is much easier for people to have capacity to engage in those than if it's some kind of outsourced activity to a to, to a parliamentary party there were some interesting questions about to what extent um, a revolutionary movement would be based in workplaces or whether movements have got a key uh, place to part that uh, part to play that aren't necessarily workplace based. I mean, the simple answer is both. Um, I think it's worth remembering that, um, you know, when Marx was writing, you know, talk about the Paris Commune or something like that, um, that wasn't a workplace based working class uprising, you know, uh, and the dominance of workplaces in, um, uh, in working class struggle, I think was particularly strong in the 20th century. Um, and uh, I think workplaces are sites of enormous potential power and are very important um, for working class struggle. Um, but we shouldn't kind of see working class struggle as only about the workplace. I think uh, uh, other sites of struggle can be important too. When we're most powerful is when those workplace and community based struggles come together, when we unite the working class with other oppressed um, uh, groups, and I think that should be the aim for revolution: is, is to kind of build that um, build that unity and struggle. There was a question about the way work has changed 
Um, and does that make it impossible uh, to have the kinds of um, uh, kind of working class movement that um, you know was the case in the seventies or the thirties or whatever? Um, I mean, clearly it has changed um, uh, and changed in many ways. But I, I think often when people paint this picture. Um, there's a slightly partial view of what the working class was in the past that's painted, you know, so at the start of the 20th century, there were more domestic servants than miners. Um, you know, uh, uh, there were lots of people working in tiny little shops, small businesses, and uh, now we've got these massive supermarkets bringing together very large numbers of workers. There are still lots of very big workplaces, you think of uh, retail and transport in particular, but if we're thinking about power, um, you know, I'd point to you know, many of the strikes around Great Manchester recently have been in, in transport. Um, we've got um, enormous potential power in logistics that I think has been exposed by all the bottlenecks that have cropped up during COVID. And of course, the CHEP strike going on at the moment is, is part of that and that they're repairing the pallets used uh, in the logistics industry. But I don't think we should restrict our view of who has power just to those, um, those sectors. I mean, in the the wave of teacher strikes in the US uh, in recent years really illustrated quite powerfully, I think, how, uh, and COVID reinforced the point that um, there are many uh, caring jobs um, uh, and jobs in, involved in the kind of reproduction of life, the social reproduction in the jargon, um, that are absolutely central to the functioning of a modern capitalist society. Um, and, uh, you know, action in those sectors can cause a crisis and, uh, uh, really affect um, those in power. Uh, I think the fact that we've got higher inflation now and are likely to have for at least some months is likely to force a continuation of the increase in strikes we've been seeing over the last year. Um, the cost of striking goes down when inflation is high um, and there are many people for whom it feels essential to fight back. You know, if you're finding that your standard of living is falling by uh, five or ten percent, um, a year. Um, I think we've got the sad truth that the left in Britain at least has really neglected organising at work um, and has focused on uh, electoral work uh, and sometimes on uh, you know, building movements in a way that didn't strengthen organisation in the workplace. I think that's something we need to address. Um, RS21 supported me writing a book about um, a guide to organising at work, which uh, should be coming out later this year from, from Pluto. And that's something we're trying to use to try to encourage a great focus on, uh, on organising at work. But that isn't enough. We need to be organising in communities too. And we need to make sure we're building a revolutionary current within all of those struggles, even if at this stage, we're not yet talking about a mass revolutionary party.